Chapter 19 The Magic of Romance Why, in a book like this, should I bring romance? What has it got to do with magic? Men and women have a mental tendency to be influenced by romance. Romance works magic and you must have the know-how about what is romantic and what is not. Before you can get the beautiful home you want, the white jaguar, the woman of your dreams, or company of the man you most want to know, you must be able to influence someone. You must be able to attract. Men and women are behind all the things you wish to acquire, and it is important that you know how best to win them to your own way of thinking. Romance is what everybody needs in their life, and you must be the one who gives them a glimpse of it. You must have a romantic personality, because like that you cannot fail. You must have charisma. Let us turn back the clock and study a romantic personality of bygone days. Rudolf Valentino, the famous film star of the silent screen, was a very romantic personality, and it is undeniably true that he is impressive still, for when his films are shown today, there are massed audiences. When Valentino was dying, when was it, 37 years ago, following an operation for appendicitis, thousands of people hurried to the churches to pray for him. One thousand people were on duty for his funeral. While he lay in a state for three days, admirers filed past the coffin at a rate of 150 a minute. They stopped counting after the 150,000 mark was passed. Crowds gathered at railway stations across America as a departed star was transported from New York to Hollywood. Rudolf Valentino was only 31, an ex-gardener who became a professional dancing partner, later an actor. The thing to remember is that Rudolf Valentino never spoke a single word in a film in his life. He did it all with his eyes, and a personality that was romantic. He won people who saw his silent films by sheer personality. He gave them the romantic touch, which is so important when it comes to winning all hearts. And today we have The Beatles, a pop group, three guitarists and a drummer, who completely captivated the Queen Mother at the Royal Variety performance and got Princess Margaret and Lord Snowden tapping to the tunes with their fingers. They have thousands and thousands of admirers who go miles to see them, and they ride and shake in private ecstasy. They are said to make all who see them supremely happy. They are other pop groups, many quite as good, but these boys are different. Communication between the boys and their audience is an electric thing. There is nothing unhealthy or pleasant, unpleasant about them. They make £2,000 a week and they have hardly begun. The fans wait in the pouring rain all night long for three days to book seats a month or two ahead. People of all ages want to see them buy their records, which are sold in hundreds of thousands. What have they got that others lack? A romantic personality, and it attracts. It draws people in their thousands, and money in thousands. They are refreshing. They are fun. They are kind. But above all, they are romantic. They attract the crowds to such an extent that the police are out in force wherever they appear. What do they communicate? Forget your worries for the moment, forget the bombs. Right now it's us, us, us. Romance. They have tremendous power and the mass fervor surrounding them proves that people do need romance in their lives. So determined to get this power, the, the unromantic get nowhere. A young American architect proposed to his girlfriend. I'll marry you, she said, if you will sit on top of a flagpole for fifteen days. The boyfriend had never sat on a flagpole, but he struck it for fifteen days. He stuck it for fifteen days. When he came down, his sweetheart exclaimed, I'm yours now. Oh, no, you're not, replied the pole squatter. 
I've had plenty of time to think up there, and I've decided you're not the one for me. That's what she got for being unromantic. You simply can't influence anyone if you make up, if your makeup isn't romantic. Adolf Herbst, one of the eleven Matthild miners who were entombed for fourteen days, was able to speak to his sweetheart on the surface. She comforted him with the words, We'll get married just as soon as you come up, darling. He was hugged by his fiancée as he emerged from the rescue shaft and a Riviera Motel owner at Cagnes sur Mer offered the couple a 15-day honeymoon free. This romantic couple attracted the attention of someone who promised them wonderful happiness. Heinz Kull, one of the eleven trapped men, said, We will mark our first anniversary by taking a trip in the sun on the Mediterranean with our families. What could be more romantic than a trip to the sun on the Mediterranean? The miners were to have a 40-day all-expenses-paid holiday and a shipping company offered them and their wives a free leisurely transatlantic trip aboard an ocean liner. You see how this romantic idea attracted the right people? I once met an Englishman who had returned from a honeymoon abroad with his beautiful bride. Did he talk of the Mediterranean and the magic of the moonlight? Not he. He said... The place is going to be overcrowded in a couple of years. The weather was good, but of course you can't trust it. Prices are going up all the time, and so on. A more unromantic man I have never met. He ended his groan with, It's nice to get back to a glass of beer. I ask you, could that man ever attract the good things to him? Could he get two thousand a week like the Beatles? Or a free holiday like the miners? Never in a hundred years would that man attract a bean. He does not know the first thing about magic. It is not until you begin to realize it, but the world is full of people who are playing their cards all wrong. I heard two women in a cafe talking the other afternoon. One said, I must get home now, dear. I have to get the ironing done before my husband gets home for his tea. The other woman explained, Goodness me, why? I never start mine until Bill gets home. Then he can see what a lot of work I have to do. Is it any wonder that homes are broken up? The first woman had the romantic touch. Everything was going to be lovely for her husband. And there was magic in her planning. The other woman, of course, would wonder why he slipped out again after tea. To post a letter or buy cigarettes. Anything to get away. There are hundreds of tragic wives whose husbands have stopped loving them, whilst others ignore romance. When he comes home from work, he kisses me as though he's been away for months, one woman told me. He follows me about from room to room. He tries to get me to sit in his lap as if we were young lovers. Sometimes I feel like screaming. If she really wants her husband to stop loving her, she is going exactly the right way about it. But if she loves him, she needs to change her attitude quickly and be a little bit more romantic. It is remarkable how some women behave to their husbands. The first word of a famous film star whose husband met her at the airport with a huge book he wore, Darling, what have you been up to? She greeted romance with a doubt. She spoiled a beautiful gesture with a ridiculous thought. M. Pierre Mendes, France, French premier and foreign minister, had these entries written into his London diary. 2 p.m. Sir Mist C. Mr. Dulles and Roses for Lenin. At 10.30pm the same night, M. M. Des France put through a telephone call from the French Embassy in London, where he was staying, to Trocadera, 14.30 in Paris, to ask Lillian whether the roses had arrived. The roses, in three shades of pink, were clustered in a huge basket on the drawing room floor of the Mendes France apartment. My husband never forgets anniversaries, anniversaries, said Linan, no matter how busy he is. She went on. Once he was away. Once when he was away, he sent me flowers, and I couldn't think why. I had to ask him. It was to mark my recovery from an operation four years before. The Mendes Frances are inseparable companions, though they have been married well over twenty years. 
Romance brings the magic happiness that everybody seeks. Shapely American showgirl Vicky Bennett was thrilled one day when a knock came on her door. A page came in with a tissue-wrapped rose. She blushed. A note fell to the floor. To the sweetest girl in the world, it read. Someone with a romantic personality gave the sort of pleasure that wins. Anton Dolan, the ballet dancer, spoke of his friendship with a rich American woman, thirty years his senior. It was a good friendship. Nina was eighty-four years old. She became very ill. Besides her bed there was a silver vase, and every time Anton Dolan visited her, he placed a red rose in it. Even when he was away, he saw to it that she had a fresh rose, red rose, every day. There was nothing between them but friendship, and this touch of romance made Nina very happy. It was Nina who gave him a magnificent pink and white villa in Monte Carlo that once belonged to Lily Langtry. Another woman said, He always brings me roses, always the same number, always the same colour. If only he would bring me something else, even dandelions for a change. See what I mean? You can kill romance easily, quickly, by lack of appreciation. By not responding. I saw a film the other day, the other day where a Spanish dancer threw a rose at a man she fancied from a street twenty feet below, and it landed perfectly in the crook of his folded arms. You've seen that sort of thing on the films, I'm sure. Always it is a rose. A businesswoman who travelled to Russia said, Moscow is the place where men are the most romantic. My finest and most agonizing moment arrived when a Russian presented himself holding a long-stemmed rose. He looked at me humbly, made a brief speech of adultation, and thrust the rose firmly into the neckline of my dress, thorns and all. Again, it was a rose. Evelyn Lee tells a be very beautiful story. She was pinned and helmeted under the dryer when her hairdresser brought her a spray of roses. She took the roses from him and read the card. All my love, Frank. Where is he? she asked. He's gone, said the hairdresser. Then he asked, is it your birthday or your wedding anniversary? Neither, she said softly. He just does things like this. It was from Frank Lawton, her actor husband, and we all know that theirs is one of the most happiest and successful of marriages. Are you a man like Mendes France, Anton Dolin, Frank Lawton, and many others I have not told you about? If you are not, it is worth trying to be like them. For they are romantic personalities, and life for them is happy, successful, and wonderful in every way. They attract these things. The Spanish men throw roses, and the teenagers throw jelly babies on the stage for the Beatles, but each in their fashion are expressing romance. And wherever there is romance, there is dynamic attraction. The right vibration. You win that way. To American college boys, actors and actresses in Hollywood, and elderly American millionaires, the romantic years last quite a time because they are always falling in love, no matter what age. Most Englishmen follow only one love affair to the end, but it can be none the less romantic. King Solomon, who is reputed to have fallen in love a thousand times and married a thousand women, for some reason or other was called the wisest man on earth. I think it is because each time he fell in love it was a romantic affair, and romance is so important that he must be deemed a wise man. Every city has its romance, and every village, and every heart its mad moment. Be sure you look for them. You can find romance in the charmed circle of your home. You can find romance anywhere. You must have the seeing eye to find the magic. The voice of prophecy, who gives such fine spiritual talks over the radio, tell the story in one of their leaflets of a unique gift that a girl's father gave to her husband on their wedding day. It was a gold watch, and beautifully engraved upon it was the words, Be nice to Sarah. 
Every time the young man looked at his watch, he was reminded of these words. I think is very beautiful. The voice of prophecy are very realistic in their talks, and this idea seems to me to be quite romantic and lovely. Many a woman marries a man with a small income, and she cooks, washes and darns for him, shops, and sometimes even she goes out to work. She has not had time to look after her figure and make herself as alluring as those beautiful women they watch on TV. She has become drab and colourless and a little irritable at times, and so she becomes less and less interested in sex and appeal, and there is no romance in her life. Yet inwardly she has the same feelings as others. She would like a romantic life, like to be admired and sought after. She must do something about it, break down the barriers and begin to love and live. You cannot be a romantic personality if you are frustrated. These feelings of frustration will finally bring her to the doctor. She will have a nervous breakdown. Napoleon loved his Josephine, but she was not a beauty. She had trouble with her teeth. Either some were missing or they protruded, I forget which. What did she do? Every time she spoke to Napoleon, she was said to have held a beautiful lace handkerchief up in front of her mouth and smiled with her eyes. The beautiful lace handkerchief enchanted him, and he never cared or noticed anything wrong. She is always also reputed to have left dainty silk and lace lingerie thrown over the back of a chair, strewn across the bed, or dropped carelessly on the floor. But always her magnificent pet pretties were on show like that. And why not? Do beautiful things have necessarily to be tucked away in a drawer, forever out of sight? Any woman can do the same, can foster romance and magic in the manner of Josephina. Look at me, am I pretty? asked Rena Cloet, the author, to a reporter when he called. He examined her politely and said cautiously, I think you are attractive. Exactly, she said, I'm not pretty, but I got myself a man in a thousand. Then she went on to say that a pretty girl might get herself a man more quickly, but she would not keep him for long unless she made herself attractive and romantic looking. You've got to become an expert in the glamour stuff too, said the author of To Catch a Man. You've got to know how to use perfume, moonlight and your clothes to the best advantage. She always wears gay, colourful, romantic clothes. It's true, wonderfully, excitingly true. And you know it the very first time you do these things. Whether he's Italian, Spanish, French or English, he will say, I love you, and if you are a romantic personality, you'll be unforgettable. Any man or any woman who sets out to be a romantic personality will draw the people like Rudolf Valentino and the Beatles. Nobody can stand up against it. You win all hearts. Victor Mature, the film star, gave his girlfriend, the ex-deb daughter of a surgeon, a heart-shaped locket, encrusted with diamonds and rubies. On it was inscribed, I love you more than yesterday. A touch of romance. You may not be able to afford diamonds and rubies, but a plain gold locket would work wonders, engraved with those words. This pretty love symbol can be used in many ways, heart-shaped bouquets made with the heads of small flowers. Eight gilded hearts shining on a bracelet make, make a romantic gift, or a linen cloth embroidered in hearts and roses. Heart-shaped soap, heart-shaped phials of perfume, glitter hearts on a cushion, heart-shaped sashes for your nightdress or his pyjamas, heart-shaped see-through gift boxes to contain safety pins, ribbons and things for the new baby, heart-shaped patty tins for the kitchen, Hearts on your apron, hearts on your girdle. There is no need for any man or woman to be without romance, where while little treasures of this sort are seen here and there in a room. Dan uh, Winter, the actress, said, I only met him once. He bowed and kissed my hand and swept me back into the romantic ages. You see little of this in our country, but on the continent it is quite usual to see this romantic greeting. In Paris, young lovers kiss in the street and nobody seems to notice. Romance is not so noticeable in this country. And talking about kisses, 
A girl kisses a man, then looks at him and giggles. You've got lipstick all over your face. Romance dies a sudden death. Never laugh about a kiss and never talk about them. A kiss is romantic and romance is not a joke. It is something very magical and lovely, something to treat with awe. Kissing can be something very special and precious. Some of the loveliest things in life are spoiled for us by laughter at the wrong moment. Kissing is one of them. Sometimes it is given in thanks for a lovely evening, sometimes sadly because it means parting, sometimes to express an affection you can't put into words, a personal magic thing. But kiss and tell lips belong to the unromantic. If one day you should visit the Taj Mahal, that beautiful love story in marble, test its peculiar echo. Stand beside the grave of those two who loved and call softly their names. From all around the building will echo the names, the two names mingling, fainter, softer, more tenderly, until at last you will hear what sounds like, I love you, I love you. Then it will die away and the echo is no more. This is romance. Now let me tell you about myself, an extract from Edinburgh Pictorial, August the 6th, 1954. To find out just how good Al Koran is off stage, we tried a little experiment on Tuesday. In the morning, the editor of the Edi Edinburgh Pictorial, during an interview with the mind reader, was asked to write any address he could think of within a radius of two miles of the Empire Theatre. He did this, and, piece, and the piece of paper with the address on was folded, placed in an envelope and sealed. This in turn was placed inside another envelope and sealed. No one but the editor was allowed to touch or see the piece of paper. When this operation was completed, the envelope was kept in his pocket until 3 p.m. on Tuesday when the mind reader and the editor met at the GPO. The, experimenter was to see, the experiment was to see whether Al-Quran, by contact mind reading, could find the address which had been written down. An independent witness was present during the whole experiment to verify that Koran did not have any possible chance to see or touch the paper. Within 25 minutes of meeting, Koran led the editor, editor to the correct address. Within 25 minutes of meeting Al Koran, he led him to the, the editor to the correct address. The envelope was opened and the number of the house checked by the witnesses. Koran had done it again. Then, from the Nottingham Guardian Journal, the headline, Mind Reader Finds Hidden Address in Nottingham. It was fantastic and a little frightening. I had always believed that a man's thoughts, if nothing else, were his personal property. That was until I met Al Koran, the Mind Reader, who was at the Nottingham Empire this week. Yesterday he risked his stage reputation by carrying out a strange experiment. He did it because people are sceptical of such things as mind reading and telepathy and often label them as stunts. So he volunteered to put his own science on a severe test. He asked a colleague of mine to write down the name and address of a friend within a two mile radius of the city centre and put this in an envelope. This was then sealed inside a larger envelope and handed to me when I went out to touch to watch the experiment. Al Quran has said that he would try to deliver the envelope it might have been a romantic letter to this address. He asked me, Do you know where this place is? And I replied, Yes. Then sit in the back of the car with me, he said. The slip of paper inside the envelope was addressed to a friend living at forty seven Habdam Street, Nottingham. Let's make for the Midland station, Corand told the photographer who was driving. We were, of course, heading for the wrong direction. But the photographer and I sat with impassive faces, expressionless. We went down Lower Parliament Street, then along London Road. Coran did not look at all like a magician, that is, the popular conception of one. He wore a blazer and neatly pressed gabardine trousers and puffed at a gold cigarette holder. He said suddenly, Turn right here and go up to the city centre, then past the Empire Theatre. This was certainly in the direction of Habdam Street. On the way we chatted about all kinds of things. For a moment we were heading the wrong way again, but Coran said, 
Do you mind turning back, please? He correctly navigated us to Dryden Street, and there was Hampton Street, the first turning on the left. We had just passed this turning when Coran said, This is where we get out. I handed him the envelope, and he walked confidently back down Hamlin Street, went to turn into number 37, then changed his mind. He walked past number 47, the house of destiny, and turned into number 49. Coran rubbed his chin reflectively. Was this the magical touch? And then went back to number 47 and announced, I'm sure this is the house, and that a young lady lives there. He was a triumphant he was a triumphant moment it was a triumphant moment for him, and an exciting one for those who saw the experiment. How did he do it? By contact mind reading, Coran told me, you knew where to go and led me, although you did not realise it. I picked up your mental reactions even when you tried to put me off the scent. Unquote. Did I say it might have been romantic? Well, there was a young lady there.